Okay, thank you, Simon. Um, can we begin the lecture? Yes, please. Okay. Good morning. Sorry, good afternoon, and also good evening to everyone. Uh, it's really nice to uh, see you again and having uh, once again Professor Simon Butt in this lecture. So today we will have the second session of the three in one of the Constitutional Law Department of the Faculty of Law Universitas Brawijaya. And um, uh, just like the Monday's lecture, uh, this lecture will be moderated by Ms. Prish Chalistining Room. So I will invite Ms. Prish, Ms. Prish Chalistining Room to, um, to the room. So Ms. Prish, time is yours. All right, thank you very much, Bu Auliana Bila, SHLLM. So uh, it's nice to see you, everybody, here uh, in our second and would be the last, uh, the three in one meeting in Constitutional Law Department. So, as we discussed before, that we will start with question and answer. Is it right, Professor Simon? Yes, I, w I just wanted to, before um, we do that, just give a bit of an overview, a bit of revision about what I discussed last uh, lecture, just as a, as a repeat or a summary of what uh, I've already said, just to uh, refresh the memory of, of the students and then maybe help prompt some more questions. All right, all right. Because Is currently... that okay? Yes, yes, because currently there is also one question. Okay, all right. All right, well, okay. Maybe, maybe if the person who asked, asked the question can be a little bit patient, we can um, get to it very soon. All right, all right. You can, you can uh, proceed now, Professor Simon. Thank you very much. All right. Um, uh, now, uh, as, um, as promised, I do want to answer some questions uh, at the beginning of this lecture, but uh, before I get to them, uh, I wanted to provide a bit of revision or a summary of what I said on Monday. Um, I always find in lectures, it's a good idea to bring students back to what you were talking about in the previous lecture, particularly if it's really one lecture divided into two, uh, just so uh, the, the, the thoughts about the first lecture are going through the, uh, through the students' uh, head as I'm talking. Now, um, in Monday's lecture, we talked a bit about Australia's federal system of government and how it affects the nature of constitutional review in Australia. And I talked about how the way that Australia developed, that is, as a grouping of six colonies uh, affects the way that constitutional review is performed in Australia today. Now, those six colonies were, for legal purposes, really six separate countries. And they were independent of each other and they had their own separate legal systems. In 1900, they decided to come together as a federation. And as part of this, they decided to establish a federal government that could do things that they could not as separate colonies, or at least that were better achieved by a single overarching government. Uh, I discussed some of the areas, things like trade and commerce and external affairs, that is uh, relationships with foreign countries. Uh, and defence of the entire island of Australia. Now, in creating this Commonwealth or federal government, the states gave up power over particular issues um, that they already had and gave it to a national Commonwealth government. But it's important to remember that they only gave up part of these powers. Um, by that, I mean, they gave power to the federal government to make laws about particular things like external affairs, but they still kept those powers for themselves. So the states still had the powers that they gave to the Commonwealth, those powers mentioned in section 
51. Now, that means that all of the sec all of the things about which the Commonwealth Government can pass laws mentioned in section 51 fall within the power of both the Commonwealth and the state governments. Uh, we say they are matters about which there is concurrent powers, that is powers held um, in parallel by more than one body. And so the question often arises in Australia, well, what happens if both the Commonwealth and the states decide to pass a law about something mentioned in article or section 51. And I mentioned briefly section 109 of the Australian constitution, which um, provides some of the answer to that question. Um, it says that if a Commonwealth and state law are inconsistent with each other, then the law of the Commonwealth shall prevail and the law of the state shall be uh, invalid to the extent of the inconsistency. Now you can um, see I have put uh, in this uh, slide here, the words of section 109, and I have used bold font for the word inconsistent and for the phrase to the extent of the inconsistency. Now, what I want to talk about today after we've had our um, question and answers session is what does inconsistent mean? How has the High Court of Australia decided whether a state law or and a Commonwealth law are inconsistent? What rules has the court created to decide or help it decide whether two laws are inconsistent? Now, there are very big textbooks um, about, I'm trying to find one, uh, about uh, constitutional law in Australia that have many, many pages about what the court has said uh, about this very issue. So to condense it down to uh, a short lecture like this one means that I will not be able to give much detail, but hopefully I'll be able to give you a taste of what the courts uh, have decided or the, the High Court has decided. And these aren't just um, academic or theoretical matters in Australia. Um, we almost uh, weekly or monthly hear about cases in the High Court of Australia where a Commonwealth, where the Commonwealth Government and a state government are having a dispute. And often these disputes resolve, revolve around whether the Commonwealth has power to pass a particular law uh, and it will have power to pass a law if the law is about something mentioned in section 51. Um, and if the Commonwealth does have power, then the question is, well, whether there's a state law that's inconsistent with that Commonwealth law. Uh, if the uh, Commonwealth can demonstrate that the state law is inconsistent with the Commonwealth law, then the state law will become inoperative, uh, will be invalidated. Now, um, I've just mentioned um, these types of constitutional review cases in the context of fights or disputes between governments. But I'd also like to mention that citizens can argue that or can use section 109 or 109 as well. Um, we'll talk in a minute about a case um, where someone was prosecuted, taken to court for a criminal offence under a state law when there was a similar constitution, uh, Commonwealth law covering the same offence. Now, he argued that because the state law under which he had been prosecuted 
was inconsistent with the, com the Commonwealth law, it therefore was inoperative and therefore his prosecution was invalid because there was no legal basis for it because he was being prosecuted in a law of a, of a state rather than by the Commonwealth. Uh, and so he was successful in having his conviction quashed on the basis that the state law under which he had been convicted was invalid through operation of section 109 of the constitution. All right, so that is a, just a basic overview of uh, what I think, at least, I said in the lecture on Monday. Uh, if anyone has any questions about that or indeed about anything else that um, uh, was raised in the last lecture, I'd be very happy to hear them. Oh. All Let right, uh, everybody. Uh, if you have question, just uh, write it down on chat. But before that, I want to let you know that Professor Simon already shared us two materials on the chat. The one is this presentation and the second is we are fortunate to have his book on Indonesian law that is written with another Australian Indonesianist, which is yes. Professor Tim Lindsay. So you can just download it now because it's for free yes okay. that's right a free thank gift you very much for everyone. Professor. all right thank you so kind of you yeah all right okay, so th me... there is a question from gumilang asan i think oh yes very good all i would right. like to ask a question regarding the last meeting when captain arthur philip came to australia how much of an impact towards australia's constitutional and its political and legal system would have it had if he didn't declare Australia as terra nullius? That is a very good question. Um, and in fact, one of the main questions that a, a, the High Court was uh, asked to consider in the famous Mabo case uh, relates to this question. Um, now, for those who might not remember, when the captain of the ship uh, carrying the first boatload of people from England to Australia to live in Australia arrived. Um, it was declared that Australia was uninhabited. Uh, and uh, one way of saying that in Latin is terra nullius. Now, the implication of this or the consequence of this was that English law could just be automatically applied. Um, under English law itself, if, a, uh, if England wanted to um, expand England into another place uh, and that place was uninhabited, then there was no difficulty in simply saying English law applies from a legal perspective. Um, but on the other hand, if the land that England wanted to take over was already settled, that's the, the term used, whether if there were already people there, then the English legal system would not automatically apply. Um, under English law, any processes for legal change in the place that England wanted to settle, any, any processes to change the law in the place that England wanted to settle would need to be followed or that law itself would need to be changed in order to allow English law to apply. Now, back then, there were many, many systems of ADAT law applying in Australia, uh, just as there have long been for centuries in Indonesia uh, with um, various village communities um, there. So if, the, if, if Arthur Philip had not described or classified Australia as terra nullius, that, meant, that means that I presume um, Aboriginal customary law would have formally applied in Australia, at least until the English um, could change that law to recognise English law. Does that, I hope, answer the question? Yes, perfect. I think that's answered the questions. <laughs> 
And I think since there is no more questions, so you can just uh, continue to the lecture today, I think, Professor. Okay, no problem. Let me share my screen again. Uh, oh, hold on. Uh, okay, can everyone see? This one? Perfect. Yes, it's clearly. Okay, good. Now, um, back to the text of section 109 uh, or 109. Um, as I said, when a law of a state, or Nagara Bagian, is inconsistent with a law of the Commonwealth, the latter, Maksudnya, the Commonwealth law, shall prevail, that, that means will override the state law, and the former, that is the state law, shall to the extent of the inconsistency be invalid. Now, I mentioned before that there are three tests, and I'll speak about these three tests in a minute, that the High Court of Australia has uh, created to determine whether a law of the state or a, a state is inconsistent with a law of the Commonwealth. And I thought it might be worth just spending a little bit of time discussing precisely the significance of, of the High Court creating a test. So we have section 109, it's, it seems to be quite clear, but the High Court of Australia interprets section 109, including by establishing some tests to help us work out what is inconsistency in section 109. Now, what happens is the High Court in its cases has created these tests. So we'll see some of the cases um, go back to the 1920s earlier days of the Australian Federation, where the inconsistency needed to be quite direct. But as time goes on, has gone on, it seems that the Commonwealth government has expanded the concept of inconsistency to allow Commonwealth law to more regularly prevail over state laws. So in, uh, in so doing, it has expanded the scope of Commonwealth power. Now, one of the, the, the important points to note here is that in creating these tests, that is by interpreting what inconsistency means in, Artic in section 109, the High Court is creating law uh, and it is creating precedents that the High Court itself follows in cases in the future. Uh, you will, I think, mostly be uh, quite familiar with the concept of precedent, but maybe you think of precedent as being judges sitting and making laws in their decisions, new principles of law in their decisions. Um, what I wanted to underline here is that judges in common law systems like Australia's can create law in the way they interpret the constitution or normal laws made by, by parliament. And so it's not just about creating principles from nothing, for, like the magicians, it's also creating principles about how to apply and interpret statutory or constitutional provisions. Now, I think Indonesia actually has uh, a similar system in some ways. Um, I'm thinking particularly of uh, the Constitutional Court of Indonesia uh, for many years now, it has interpreted its rules of standing. Kedudukan para pihak, kalau nggak salah, kedudukan uh, legal standing of the pihak. 
in a consistent way. It has provided five principles um, in cases for, for many, many years. Uh, and this can be seen as perhaps an example of it interpreting its own rules of standing from the constitutional court law. Now, I think that there are, in fact, a few examples of the Constitutional Court of Indonesia doing this. Uh, another case or, or, or series of cases in which I think the Constitutional Court of Indonesia does this quite conspicuously uh, is in discrimination cases. It, it talks about previous cases in which it's decided um, issues of discrimination uh, and it's defined what discrimination is. Um, this too, I think, is interpreting what discrimination means in the Constitution. Uh, and even though I, I think the Constitutional Court of Indonesia's decisions aren't formally binding on it, it doesn't have to follow previous decisions of its own, it will usually prefer to do that. Uh, in Australia, the High Court of Australia will almost always follow its decisions and if its previous decisions, if it decides not to, and it can choose not to, then it will usually feel like it needs to spend a lot of time uh, explaining why it is not following its own decisions. So maybe that's a bit of a difference between the, the common law and the civil law there. So I've um, looked at these um, various cases uh, and these various high court decisions. And I can see that there are three tests which the high court uses to determine whether a state law and a Commonwealth law are inconsistent. And I want to spend the rest of the lecture today talking about what these tests are and provide some case examples of how these tests operate. Um, the first is where it is, is impossible to obey both laws, where obeying one law will violate the other law. And I'll, again, I'll provide examples. Um, two, where there is a conflict of rights privileges or entitlements. And the first and the second tests are both examples of direct inconsistency, what the High Court calls direct inconsistency. The third test, which is much more controversial and seems to do a lot more to expand Commonwealth power at the, at the expense of states, is the so-called cover the field test. When the Commonwealth passes a law that intends to comprehensively cover an area, then the state law will be invalid if it also enters that area. If the state law tries to cover a similar area or the same area uh, that the Commonwealth has already said is its area, in the legislation itself. Now, I'd also like to point out that the other part of section 109 that I have put in a bold font is to the extent of the inconsistency. And so this means that the High Court can only declare invalid the part of the state law that is inconsistent with the Commonwealth law. Going back to when Federation started, the states had all the power and they decided to give some to the Commonwealth. So the High Court has kept this in mind and it says, well, you can't use section 109 uh, too aggressively. It's, it's more like a scalpel rather than a blunt knife. You can use it, but only to the extent that you need to, to use it to prevent the inconsistency, which means if it's possible to remove inconsistency between a state and a Commonwealth law, 
by removing one provision from the state law rather than invalidating the whole of the state law, then that's what the, the High Court should do. It shouldn't use Section 109 as an excuse to allow the Commonwealth to completely override an entire um, law of a state um, unless uh, the Commonwealth intended to cover the field um, with its law. So to the first test, impossibility of obedience. And this will uh, happen, this, this test will be fulfilled if the state law and the Commonwealth law contain contradictory provisions, provisions that contradict each other about the same topic, such that it is impossible to comply with both laws simultaneously. Uh, and this will happen very clearly if complying with one law would violate the other law. Now, let me give you some case examples. And this is how uh, in Australia, and I think in many other common law countries, um, law is taught. So we would talk about a, um, a principle of law and then explain not only how that principle works in practice through case examples, but also underline the elements of the case that create precedents or precedent, I should say. So we look at the, the general principles and then we look at how the courts have applied them, not only to help us understand the principles themselves, but also to examine the extent to which the courts might also have made any law uh, themselves when answering the when, when deciding these cases. So let's look at R. R is, R is a short word, a short sinkatan uh, for the word Regina, which means the state or the crown. Um, and the licensing court of Brisbane. Now I won't go into the background behind this case, but essentially the conflict between state and Commonwealth laws was this. A law of Queensland said that referendums must be held on the same day as elections. So if the, uh, uh, in Indonesia, I don't think there are such things as referendums, but in order to change the constitution of Australia, there needs to be a referendum held, which is basically putting a vote on the, 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 the change to the constitution to the entire population who can vote on whether it should uh, pass or not, whether the constitution should be changed. And this law of Queensland said that if you wanna change the constitution using a referendum, you have to hold that vote on the same day as a federal election. Now, a Commonwealth law said that uh, elections cannot be, sorry, that, that um, referendums cannot be held on the same day as federal elections. So the court, th there was a direct conflict here. The court decided that it was impossible to obey, obey both laws. And so the Queensland statute was held to be invalid. <clears throat> Don't forget, a, the High Court will not invalidate the Commonwealth law in the case of in, in case there's an inconsistency. They'll always only involve invalid, invalid, invalidate the state law because that's what Section 109 of the Constitution authorizes it to do. The, the second question, the second case here. McBain and the state of Victoria was, I think, quite an interesting case. And it might be considered to be quite a controversial case in both Australia and in Indonesia if, if it was to happen there. So there was a state law which was called the Victorian Infertility Treatment Act of 1995. And 
one of its provisions said that if a woman wanted to get IVF treatment, infertility treatment, intro, what is it? Uh, I, can, I forgot the actual name of IVF. In, in but vitro fertilization, you mean? That's it, exactly. Right. Thank you. I'm glad you said it. Um, in order to obtain that, a woman either needed to be married or living with a man in a de facto relationship. Now, I'm not sure whether you have de facto relationships in Indonesia, but if two people live together in a relationship, even though they're not married, after a particular amount of time, they can be treated as if they are married for the purposes of the law. So they can live in sin for, uh, I think it's one or two years, and then they are treated as if they were married um, for the purposes of uh, things like property settlements when they, when they, if they were to split up. So if they bought a house together, for example, um, even if they weren't married, uh, they could split the property down the middle. They could split ownership of the property as if they were married. So section eight of this um, law said that to get IVF treatment, a woman needed to be married to a man or in a de facto relationship living with a man. Section 22 of the Commonwealth Sex Discrimination Act said that it was unlawful to refuse service to someone based on their marital status. So on the one hand, we have the Victorian law saying to get this service, you need to be married. Section 22 of the Com Commonwealth law says you're not allowed to discriminate based on marital status. Now, this is quite an interesting case because it was brought by the doctor who wanted to give uh, infertility treatment to a single woman who was not living in a de facto relationship. What did the court decide? Well, the, the, the court decided that Dr. McBain could not obey both laws when providing treatment. He couldn't um, uh, refuse to give service uh, on the, to, the, to, on the, to someone on the basis of their marital status when Section 8 of the Victorian law said that he couldn't give service uh, because of the marital status. And so the court decided that the Victorian Act was invalid to the extent of the inconsistency with the Commonwealth Act. Importantly, the court didn't uh, invalidate the entire uh, Victorian law, but just the requirement that the woman need to be married or living with a man in a de facto relationship. Is that case clear? Yes, very clear. Yeah, it is partly okay. invalidate, right? Like what yes, constitutional that's, court that's, in Indonesia usually do, membatalkan sebagian, right? Sebagian, betul, betul. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I'm not sure whether that case would happen in, in Indonesia, but uh, it's an interesting case to uh, study, I think. I wanted to ask all of the students here a question. Um, and I'm not quite sure how we will, uh, we will find out what you, you think on Zoom. Maybe some, someone can... Um, can raise their hand and um, give me an answer if they're brave enough. But a Commonwealth Act provides that it is illegal to smoke in a public place. This is a hypothetical question, the kind of question that we would ask in an exam, in an examination in Australia. A Commonwealth Act provides or says that it is illegal to smoke in any public place where food is served. A Western Australia Act, Western Australia is a state of Australia, 
provides that all restaurants must have a designated dining room where smoking is allowed. The question is, is the Western Australian Act invalid? Does anyone want to have a, a an attempt at trying to answer the question? Mungkin ada yang ingin menjawab pertanyaan dari Profesor Simon. Mahasiswa. Boleh dalam bahasa Indonesia juga. Boleh dalam bahasa Indonesia menjawabnya, karena Profesor Simon memahami bahasa Indonesia. Silahkan. Jadi ada pertanyaan di mana uh, aturan atau hukum negara uh, pemerintah pusat Commonwealth uh, menyatakan bahwa uh, uh, ilegal atau tidak diperbolehkan untuk merokok di uh, tempat umum. Sedangkan hukum negara bagian Western Australian Act menyatakan bahwa uh, semua restoran harus mempunyai uh, tempat makan di mana memperbolehkan orang untuk uh, merokok. Nah, pertanyaannya apakah undang-undang uh, atau aturan negara bagian di sini bisa dinyatakan invalid terhadap Commonwealth Act tersebut? Bagaimana? Ada yang akan menjawab? Ada yang berani menjawab? Uh, mau coba menjawab, Bu. Tapi takut Silakan. salah. Oh, it's fine. Uh, Profesor Simon tidak akan menghukum karena salah. Oh, enggak. enggak. Pasti enggak. Kalau mau menghukum oh. juga, kalau karena di Australia, enggak berlaku hukumannya. Alright. <laughs> yes, you may proceed, Zahira. Uh, okay, I think the Western Australian Act is can be said as invalid rules because... Uh, aturan yang terdapat di negara bagian West Australian bertentangan dengan aturan yang dikeluarkan oleh Commonwealth. Dan, hmm. as I know, jika ada dua aturan, aturan pusat dan aturan negara bagian, dan aturan negara bagiannya itu bertentangan dengan aturan pusat, maka yang harus dijalankan adalah aturan pusat. Jadi, aturan negara bagiannya bisa dikatakan invalid. Betul. So, Yes, I think that's right. And the, 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 the application, this is an example of the application of section 109. So it's on the one hand, you have a Commonwealth law saying it's illegal to smoke. But on the other hand, in a place where, the, where, the, where, where food is served, on the other hand, you have a Western Australian Act requiring that all restaurants must have a place where smoking is allowed. So, in other words, you have an implicit um, uh, uh, permission to smoke in that area in, in Western Australia, which seems to have been prohibited by the, the Commonwealth Act. This is actually a bit of a trick question because um, one thing that would first have to be established in any constitutional review case in Australia like this is whether the Commonwealth has power to pass that law in the first place. So the Commonwealth only has power to pass laws about things that are in section 51. Now, there is nothing in section 51 that talks about smoking. I don't think there's anything that talks about health uh, or restaurants uh, or trade within a state and presumably um, um, the Western Australian Act only covers trade within Western Australia. So the question is, and this is the way we would say it in Australia, is there a head of power under which the Commonwealth can make a law in respect of smoking or making smoking illegal? Now, it may be that there is an international convention about smoking or smoking related illnesses that requires the, the national government to, um, to, to ban smoking in public places. I'm not an expert in public health, so I don't know. There are possibilities that the Commonwealth government could use the external affairs power and ratify a treaty and therefore give its power, give itself power under section 51. There's also a possibility, I suppose, that um, the Commonwealth could pass a law about corporations 
uh, and corp the corporations that are restaurants that um, uh, that provide um, you know places to come and eat could be um, regulated through that head of power. That's a little bit controversial, I suppose, as well. Um, but that's that's one thing that would be first considered by a court. There is no conflict if. The Commonwealth does not have power to pass the law because if the Commonwealth does not have power to pass the law, then there can be no conflict because there is no Commonwealth law. So the court could declare the Commonwealth Act invalid on the basis that it does not have power to pass a law that prohibits smoking in public places. So that was a bit of a trick question, but you're right. If we presume that there is power, then there seems to be quite a direct conflict, and the um, and the uh, Australian Western Australian Act would be declared invalid under Section One Hundred and Nine. All right, now, the second... Professor Simon, I yes? think it is it is interesting because because the two previous example, I think the one that is invalidated by the court is the state law, right? And yes, your always. Example, it it could be the Commonwealth Act. So, is there any example when the court invalidate the Commonwealth Act? In well, not not regards? not for not for Section one hundred nine cases, which is what I'm focusing on today, because all Section one hundred nine does is says, well, if there's a Commonwealth law and a state law that are the same about the same thing, and they, there's an inconsistency then the state law is invalid to the extent of the inconsistency. The issue about the Commonwealth law lacking validity really goes back more to what I was talking about in the last lecture, which was that in order to pass any law, the Commonwealth must be able to say, here is our authority to pass the law. And section 51 of the constitution contains all the things that Commonwealth can pass laws about. So there are in fact, many cases brought by to the High Court by state governments uh, where they complain that the Commonwealth has passed a law about which it does not have power or concerning an issue uh, it has no power over. And unfortunately for the Commonwealth, if the High Court decides that there is no power to pass the law, then the um, then the, the Commonwealth law will be invalid and the states will win. So for example, if you remember the Tasmanian dam case, we had the state government passing a law authorizing the creation of the dam. We had a another case where, um, oh, sorry, and we had the Commonwealth law trying to ban the dam by th through, an through its external affairs power to give effect to a treaty. Now, there were some arguments in that case about whether it was appropriate for the Commonwealth government to use its external affairs power in that way, whether it could actually uh, bring into effect, or for, uh, sorry, whether it could use any international obligation as a basis for uh, Commonwealth law or only particular types of of international relations. Does external affairs relate to um, international treaties? These types of questions were, were considered hundreds and hundreds of pages by the, by the higher court. Uh, and the main purpose of that, um, that, that part of its decision was determining whether the Commonwealth had power to pass a law um, of that nature. All right, yeah. thank you. No worries. So the second um, test, uh, and remember what I'm talking about here is um, um, legal tests or legal principles that the High Court has created to determine or to help it work out whether uh, a, a state law and a Commonwealth law are inconsistent. The second is denial of benefits. So one law removes, alters or detracts from a right, immunity or privilege conferred by the other law. And this will usually happen when a Commonwealth law provides some form of benefit that the state law then 
takes away. Now, let me give you some examples again. Um, the first one, a very famous case about inconsistency is what's called Clyde Engineering and Cowburn. And these are the names of the parties in the case. Um, you can see on the right-hand side, the Colvin v. Bradley brothers case, I've given you the legal reference. So this is the, the reference that tells you what year the case was decided. And also the legal reference, the book you need to go to to find the entire case. We have what's called a system of law reporting, a bit less relevant nowadays with the internet uh, and it making it very easy to find cases. But um, back a few decades ago, when I was a student, you would have to go to the library, find CLR, which is the Commonwealth Law Reports, find volume 68, number 68 on the, on the law reports. Uh, so that was one big thick book. And then part, find page 151. And there you would find Colvin and Bradley Brothers, the case. So that's just an example of how we, how we reference legal cases um, in Australia. Now, this is another interesting case, I think, Clyde Engineering and Cowburn. The New South Wales law, so there's a New South Wales and a Commonwealth law here. So it was about working hours. And this is, I suppose, quite relevant, talking about working conditions, given your new omnibus law. Um, the, uh, the New South Wales law said that workers should work for 44 hours per week. And that after that 44 hours, the workers should get overtime. What's the Indonesian for overtime? Tambahan. Uang, uang lembur. Uang lembur. Uang lembur. Upah lembur. Yeah. So over the normal salary, an additional yeah. payment. All right. The Commonwealth law said that workers in the engineering industry must work or should work 48 hours and that wages would be deducted if 48 hours weren't worked. So one is saying, the New South Wales law is saying 44 hours and then you get an additional amount. The Commonwealth is saying 48 hours, but we will reduce the amount if you don't work up to that, up to the 48 hours. Does that make sense? Yes. So what happened was Calburn, an employee, worked a 44-hour week in compliance with the New South Wales law and expected a full salary. But his employer, Clyde Engineering, tried to use the Commonwealth law and said, you have to work 48 hours and because you've only worked 44, we will take some money from your salary. Now, looking at the previous test, the impossibility of obedience test. Could that be applied in this case? Is it impossible to comply with both laws? Yes, because there is a different standard, right? There is a different standard, but is it possible for an employee just to work 44 hours and suffer the deduction? So, I don't know if you can say that Clyde, sorry, Calburn, the employee, would disobey one law by complying with the other. He would just suffer a benefit that was conveyed to him by the New South Wales law. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. So by working 44 hours and meeting the New South Wales law test, he was then kind of losing the benefit because the Commonwealth law made him uh, or, or allowed his employer to reduce his pay by whatever the four hour equivalent would be. Now, it's funny because we look at this or I look at this case from the perspective of the employee 
But don't forget that Section 109 only allows the invalidation of the state law. So the court held that the state 44-hour um, week uh, provision was invalid because it was inconsistent with the Commonwealth law. And the way that the court described this was the employer is entitled to reduce the pay under the Commonwealth Act and the State Act took away that entitlement. So the benefit under the Commonwealth Act was taken away by the State Act and therefore from the perspective of the employer and therefore the state law, the New South Wales law was invalid. Law doesn't always work for the little person. It sometimes works for the big boss. All right. <laughs> it's true, unfortunately. Now, we're running out of time. We've only got five minutes um, left in the, in the lecture, but I'll just keep going with... Um, uh, let me jump ahead to indirect inconsistency. This is a little bit more uh, controversial and difficult. Um, it is the third test. You'll see I've, I've kind of jumped over the ice cream case and the and the and the um, and the um, the Colvin case, which is about whether a woman could work a milling machine. One law said she could. Another law said she couldn't. Um, Indirect inconsistency, uh, by contrast, happens when the Commonwealth passes a law that intends to cover the field, and then state legislation, the, st the states passes a law that enters that field. This is a quite difficult um, area of law because sometimes the Commonwealth doesn't say in its laws whether it intends to cover the field. And, and, and what I mean by cover the field here is whether the Commonwealth law seems to be detailed enough to, um, uh, to be to, so that it seems that the law is intended to, to regulate the entirety of the subject matter of the law. So whether the, the Commonwealth law aims to be comprehensive so that um, uh, there is no need for a state law. Um, if that's the case, then if the states try and pass a law about the same thing, then it can be held to be uh, inconsistent with the Commonwealth law. Let me provide an example, another controversial one, um, which probably would not happen in Indonesia, but I'm sure you've all heard about same-sex marriage and the debates that are occurring around the world um, in countries like Australia. A couple of years ago, um, for many years, um, people of the same gender have wanted to be able to be formally married uh, and the government has said no, um, this changed recently in, in Australia. Um, but this case, the Commonwealth and the Australian Capital Territory related to um, this issue. The Australian Capital Territory government passed a law to allow same-sex marriages. It was called the Marriage Equality now, the Commonwealth government had passed a law called the Marriage Act. And if you remember back to last Monday's lecture, marriage, in fact, most areas of family law are, um, are matters that fall within section 51 of the constitution. Now, the interesting point was um, whether the Australian or the Commonwealth uh, Act purported or, or in, it showed an intention to cover the field. Now, 
in 2004, so around 10 years before this case came before the courts, the Commonwealth had deliberately amended the marriage law to make it very clear that it did not apply to people of the same gender. It only applied to men and women. And it's a, it's a marriage law, a bit like your marriage law. It's quite a comprehensive act. It's, it covers a lot of matters of marriage and religion and divorce uh, and all sorts of things like that. Now, the court decided that the two acts were inconsistent. So one allowed marriage between same gendered people and one did not permit this. But it also decided that, so, so it probably would have, uh, would have um, met the indirect inconsistency test. But the court, the High Court also said that the marriage law was intended to cover the field. It was a detailed act. It was meant to cover all aspects of family law. Sorry, my, my, um, my uh, light went out. Maaf ya, lampunya itu ada sensornya. Kalau nggak jalan, kalau nggak berdiri, nanti lampunya mati di sini. Jadi All right. maaf tadi. <laughs> so um, the court decided that the marriage law was intended to really cover all areas of marriage and divorce and these types of things. And so it covered the field of of marriage. And therefore it was um, uh, uh, not, not, not permissible for the state to enter into that field of, of marriage under Section 109. Um, last case, Hume and Palmer. I've got a picture of the beautiful Sydney Harbour because this case involved a person who was a captain of a ship and he was uh, coming into Sydney Harbour Port Jackson is the name of the area of the harbour pictured here. And he did not um, obey rules of navigation. He failed to give way to another ship. So, dia tidak, apa namanya? Mengalah. What's the word? To give way? Um, there was almost an accident because he did not follow um, the rules of navigation. Now, the rules of navigation were contained, the same rules were contained in both a New South Wales law and a Commonwealth law, but the Commonwealth law applied a stronger penalty, a more um, severe penalty. Now, the Commonwealth did not decide to prosecute Mr Palmer I think his name was the Palmer. Uh, Palmer, yes. He decided not to prosecute him. But the New South Wales government decided that it wanted to prosecute him for failing to obey the rules in the, in, 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 in the state law. So he was taken to court in New South Wales. Now, he must have had very good lawyers because they argued that the law under which he was prosecuted, the New South Wales law, was inconsistent because uh, mm. there was already a Commonwealth law uh, that, that prohibited the same offence. And the state courts did not have power to prosecute under Commonwealth law, only under state law. Don't forget there, it's almost like separate countries. So essentially what he, what he was able to demonstrate here was that there was a conflict between the two. They were inconsistent because even though the offences were, were the same, the penalties were different. They were higher under the Commonwealth law. Um, now, the High Court decided that the Commonwealth law was intended to cover the field. And this is quite interesting because... 
one of the factors the court took into account was the need to have uniform rules of navigation throughout Australia to, 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 so there wasn't confusion about what they were from state to state. And so it decided that the Commonwealth had, in fact, chosen to cover the field. Therefore, the state and the state government had entered into that field. And as a result, the state law was invalid. So Mr. Palmer was able to escape conviction to avoid being um, prosecuted and convicted under the New South Wales law because the High Court said that provision of the New South Wales law was invalid. Okay, now I have on my last slide another question, but I don't think we have time to cover it, particularly if we um, consider some, some questions. So uh, I think that's probably all I have, uh, have time to, to cover at the moment. So hopefully that was interesting, but um, let's see what the questions say. We've got time for a few questions. All right, yes. There's a question from Laras about the LGBT inconsistency cases. Well, oh, that's a good question. If a person is already transgender, is there a rule of law in Australia about permission to change the status sex? Of his... I don't know about that. I don't know about that, unfortunately. Um, but generally speaking, if people want to, to change their gender, they, and they're old enough and they're over 18, they are able to go to a doctor and, and start the process. All right. Um, in Indonesia, possible? I'm not so sure as, as well. But I think, yeah, some of the transgender, I think they could get their status through the court, yeah. yeah. Mendapatkan penetapan perpindahan oh, kelamin, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Yeah. So then Jimmy about G. the same-sex marriage, is it uh, possible in Australia? Is it alone? It is now, yes, it is. So a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago, the national government changed the law. All right, all right. So, so the it is now national government it. itself changed the law, okay. That's right. right, that's right, that's right. There was a big campaign, uh, a big public education campaign, um, and... There were many sides to, to the debate. Many um, religious organisations did not agree with the um, with the, the rules, um, but I think the parliament um, decided that if people did not want to marry uh, and they were the same gender, then they, there's nothing to stop them from not marrying. Um, uh, the the idea being that if people wanted to get married, they should just be able to. Um, people uh, suggested that maybe a different type of, of um, marriage should be created for people of the same gender, but that didn't happen. All right. There. All right. So to the present, there, is there any cases where the Commonwealth law is invalidated? Yes, yes. So... Um, I'm just trying to think of, of some examples um, of that. I mean, as the, the I, I have not I have not got any any um, cases prepared to, to discuss about that. But yes, one of the main um, one of the main uh, things the High Court will first do in cases of inconsistency is work out whether the con the Commonwealth has power to pass the law, and if they don't, then the state law wins because the Commonwealth law is declared invalid. From Zahira, Professor, if I may ask, if there was a huge opposition from the Commonwealth rules and the Ngarabagya and what will happen, will it bring to the court? Um, yes. So if um, usually what would happen here is the state would pass a law, the Commonwealth didn't like it, and so it passed its own law to override the state law. That's what... That's what happened in the case of, um, uh, it's happened before in, in several cases. And, um, and then um, the question is who, who will bring it to the court? Will it be a, uh, a citizen like in McBain or will it be a state uh, or will it be the Commonwealth who wants, it depends on who wants what. If it's a state, a state might go to the court and 
argue that the Commonwealth law is invalid and therefore should be struck down by the by the High Court. Uh, a Commonwealth, um, the Commonwealth would would be arguing in these types of cases that there is an inconsistency under Section 109 and therefore the state law should be invalid. So the case will be brought to the High Court, right? But Correct. I think in the previous uh, lecture, you mentioned that the constitutional I mean, review could be done in the pengadilan negeri level. So that's well. Look, there are some cases where that happens in Australia, but it's quite rare. What I mentioned in the last lecture was more the US model, where that happens much more regularly. All right, all right, all right. All right. All right. So it is not the case for Australia. All right. No, no. There are some cases where the federal court has. Um, has decided cases based on some constitutional principles, but um, very rarely, very rarely. It's almost always the High Court. All right, all right. So uh, is there any question from the floor? I think that's all for the questions. So you wanna have some concluding remarks for your uh, well, no, I would just say thank you very much for uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Hopefully um, you found it interesting and you understood um, some of the differences between constitutional review in Australia, a common law country, and a um, and constitutional review in, in, in Indonesia, like a, a civil law uh, country. As you can see, it's quite different. The, diff the strategies behind bringing cases, the rules, um, the, the, the basic assumptions of constitutional review are quite different in, in different countries. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Simon. No so problem. It is a very um, good materials that bring us to kind of know what's happening in other legal systems and we can just share and compare each other whether there is best practice from each others. So thank you very much, Professor Simon, for your My presence today. My for, pleasure. Thank you for having for me. For the lecture. All right. Uh, and we hope we will st we will still have another program, right? Uh, and yes. you will also be with us in the international seminar. Yes. And on maybe Bu Inda and Bu Aulia will add something. All right, Bu Aulia. All right, uh, I also just want to say thank you very much once again for um, being able to be with us, uh, for being here for the program. Uh, I'm sure that students uh, also have another meaningful perspective uh, so that they can use, um, they can uh, better their, their skills in, compare, in comparing uh, cases and also uh, things and issues in the legal system between civil law and common law. So yeah, uh, I think that's all. And uh, we will see you on Friday on and on Monday in the seminar, I guess. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Oli. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, terima kasih.